Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. We're going to shift gears this afternoon and talk about endangered, threat endangered species um, and H8112, with, starting with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, for the record, my name is John Austin. I am the Director of Wildlife with the Fish and Wildlife Department. And with me today is uh, Dr. Rosalind Renfrew. She is the program manager for the Species Diversity Program in Wildlife Division, who oversees all things threatened and endangered species related. And also with me today is uh, General Counsel Catherine Guessing. Uh, Counsel Guessing joined us today uh, just in the event that if there's a uh, discussion regarding, um, in particular, Bill 587 that deals with enforcement issues, um, she would be best to respond to, to issues related. Right. So actually, can I just, you, you remind me that we had some bill introductions related to wildlife, threatened endangered species with Representative Brennan the end of last week that may also be considered under this topic today. So thank you for that. Thank you. Sure. Um, so we're here to, today to talk about, in particular, Bill H812, um, but also to the extent the committee is interested, we can talk about uh, H587, 588, and 597, they all have bearing on one another. Um, so I thought what we would do is uh, turn it over to Dr. Renfrew in just a moment, and she's going to go through uh, sort of the, the 101 on biodiversity conservation and how the uh, Vermont Endangered Species Law works today. Um, and then we can use that as an opportunity to have a conversation after her presentation about the department's view of um, Bill 812 and the other bills that are associated with it and how we can work together to move things forward. Because we're delighted that the committee is interested in this topic. Uh, it's very much a shared interest. Um, we're all concerned about biodiversity conservation. And in particular, we're concerned about making sure we're doing everything we can for our most vulnerable species. So I think um, with Dr. Renfrew's presentation, that will provide hopefully some helpful context for all of you to understand the scope, the lay of the land of, of how things work now with the Endangered Species Law and permitting to the Endangered Species Committee to the Species Advisory Groups and recovery planning and all of that. With that context, we can then talk about the bill and um, how we might move forward together. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Renfrew and then uh, talk about the bill. Thanks, John. Awesome. For the record, my name is Rosalind Renfrew, Wildlife Diversity Program Manager of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us here today. I want to echo John's appreciation. Um, I've been really looking forward to this and digging in into this topic. Um, we think about threatened and endangered species all the time um, in my program, and it's really great to be able to extend um, our passion uh, and interest to this group and, um, and see what we can do together. Um, so I really appreciate your invite, committee members, Chairwoman Sheldon. Um, it's, it's greatly appreciated. So I, uh, I have a, John introduced me a little bit. I have a PhD in wildlife ecology, and uh, I've been spending most of my career doing uh, bird research and conservation uh, work, but I joined the Fish and Wildlife Department two and a half years ago and have greatly broadened my scope, or I'm trying to, to all kinds of different taxonomic groups many species and plants and uh, learning all the time. Uh, we have an amazing group of talented, knowledgeable people um, on our staff. And um, it's really a joy and a learning experience every day to work with them. Uh, I wanted to dance. What does that want to dance? Yeah. The arrows aren't uh, no the the arrows and the, oh oh there we go why well, that didn't work is that the arrow or something else I'm there's just a menu it maybe it was just me standing over it that's <laughs> it your aura so um to carry on uh so the people in this department are very dedicated to this mission um their passion is incredibly strong. They go above and beyond every day. 
Uh, I love our mission because it's about the wildlife and it's about the people. Um, but one thing to add to it is it's for the people of Vermont, but it's also for the future of Vermont. It's for the future of the species and the people um, and the survival of all of the above. Uh, and I like to emphasize that. I mean, these, these, these pieces of legislation on the table are, are kind of, I think they're forward looking and, um, and a part of that solution. So I'm just, I'm, like John said, I'm gonna talk a bit about some basic uh, ecology 101 concepts. Um, forgive me if, if it's you know, something you've already been well-versed in. I thought it might help set the ground, groundwork. Uh, and then talk about the law, the endangered species law, and how it is implemented by Fish and Wildlife and all the partners around the state uh, without whom we would never accomplish um, the work that we all do together. It's really a, truly a team effort. And I know that sounds corny, but it's quite true that we can't all do all this important work um, in isolation. So this group's all been around the block on biodiversity. Uh, so what I wanted to say though, uh, was that it is in the eye of the beholder in terms of you know, what does biodiversity mean to you? Uh, it can be landscape diversity. It can be about natural community diversity across those landscapes. Um, a lot of people I think think of biodiversity in terms of the number of species that are around. I think that's probably the most common perception. There's also genetic diversity which is really important um, to our work, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so I just wanted to recognize these different scales at which biodiversity can be, can, that can be described by, by the word biodiversity. And it's really all encompassing and a <clears throat> uniting word that kind of fits everything, uh, but it's also in the eye of the beholder. So in Vermont, if you just talk about species biodiversity, this is sort of a, the roundup of what we have. And you'll notice, I hope it's <laughs> large enough. Uh, you'll notice that most of our species in Vermont are fungi and invertebrates, and we don't even know how many we have. And they're also, <clears throat> we know the least about, and the fewest species are the vertebrates, uh, and we probably know the most about those. So we, there's a lot we don't know about our biological diversity. Uh, and a lot of it is literally under the ground. It's sort of like the iceberg where the top of the iceberg is above the water line, right? <clears throat> a lot of people like to use that analogy. <clears throat> uh, just in case you were doubting whether biodiversity was important to the rest of the world, there's this World Economic uh, Forum that does reports every year and, and figures out from all these experts, uh, business, government, academia, uh, international community, uh, what are the important global risks? And they laid out 40, 34 of them. I only show the top 10 here, but biodiversity falls uh, in third place uh, as a, the major threat to reckon with in the next 10 years. And the only things above it are uh, associated with climate change. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into the impacts of climate change today. I feel like that needs a lot more than a slide or two. Um, obviously, there, there's going to be a massive sort of rearrangement of, of species on the landscape, and it's very hard to predict uh, a lot about what that's going to look like and how species will, species assemblages will break up and reform and how they'll move. And as you know, we are just trying to conserve the landscape in a way that they can move, um, which uh, efforts like Act 59 um, strive to do. So I'm gonna talk about some of the other threats, just briefly, uh, another threat you're certainly aware of uh, is, is the habitat loss and fragmentation um, from our human use of the landscape in certain ways, how that reduces the quality of the habitat by creating these edge effects, which, which change the interior portions, the more interior portions of, um, of ecosystems and uh, the disturbance and the displacement it causes um, for many species. I just have a bat here. There's a lot of bat species. These are the woods um, for roosting and uh, all, of, all of them are uh, endangered or threatened. Is your, is your animation a real development in Vermont? Yeah, I got it from somebody else, but that's a real I, I time. I believe it is, yeah. We've been using this one for some time. BNRC helped put that one together. <laughs> I'm really glad it worked because it doesn't always work when you hook it up. Yeah, it doesn't work in the PDF. But oh, so you know. Yeah, it's, it looks like a, a nice intact forest, except with, there's a large road going up to it on our screen. 
Uh, other threats, I'm not going to cover them all. I'm just kind of breezing through a few of them. Um, for birds, cats are a huge threat, one of the biggest threats to bird populations. Uh, uh, for bats, obviously, the white nose syndrome is caused by a disease, a fungal disease. Uh, and that was, they believe, transferred from Europe. So globalization is transporting stuff all over the world, transporting viruses and diseases, as we know from COVID. Uh, well, wildlife are experiencing that as well, and that's a real threat. Um, right now we have uh, avian influenza that's, that's going around. Uh, wildlife trafficking is a threat for some species. Uh, there's in Vermont, wood turtles are subject to wildlife tra being trafficked by, to wildlife trafficking, and also invasive uh, species, both invertebrate and plants. They, uh, they are a threat in terms of taking over uh, native species. Representative Bongar. Just since you just happened to mention it, mm -hmm. uh, I have, I think I have heard that the, the bat population, the cave dwellers with white nose, white nose syndrome has, the those that have survived are beginning yeah. to, are beginning to come back a little bit. Is that, is that true? Yeah, it's, it seems like one or two of the species have sort of stabilized and maybe coming back. It's a little early to say, but it, but some are more resilient, than, are showing to be more resilient than others. And it's, it's early to tell how that's gonna play out, but it gives us a lot of hope that maybe we've, maybe we're past the bottom point. You also, and, also to just say some of. Right, that right. others are still quite low in their populations and haven't, haven't come back up yet. Inside recovery. Yeah. We could do a whole talk with you about, about that. <laughs> Another fundamental eco ecological concept that I know you've probably all talked about and, and learned about are natural communities. Um, uh, this is important to mention uh, because they are what uh, holds these species that we're concerned about that are rare, threatened, or endangered. And a lot of times the natural communities are rare, and that's why the species are rare. Uh, but it's the physical environment and the assemblage, assemblage of species um, and the processes that affect them, them that make up a natural community. So one example here is the timber rattlesnake, uh, kind of a popular species in a certain way and, and a species that other people don't want to hear about sometimes, uh, associated with dry chestnut oak woodland natural community, uh, which is in the Taconic Mountains and, and some in the Southern Champlain Valley. Um, another one would be the West Virginia white butterfly uh, that, that uh, feeds on nectar from the toothwort, which is a, a small plant in rich, uh, rich northern hardwoods. Uh, so there's, there's these species associations that, um, with their plants that also attach them to their natural communities. So it's all part of that web of life that make up biodiversity. We have a question from Representative Smith. Thank you very much for, for this. I, and you brought up uh, a picture of a timber rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me why on earth anybody wants to protect a poisonous rattlesnake? Because <laughs> the same as you want to protect those black flies and mosquitoes. Well, I didn't say I wanted to protect them. <laughs> but it just seems odd. You know, there's plenty of rattlesnakes in Texas and the, the border down that way. But what is the urgency of saving a rattlesnake? Well, that's a, in the eye of the beholder. They are part of a, the natural community um, that occurs in the Taconic Mountains. And uh, that's a pretty unique community. There's a In the Rutland of, area, which down that way? Down that way, south of there. But, wow. And uh, it's a pretty unique community. It has, it has a lot of unique natural communities within it because of the underlying rock. Um, and uh, it's, is, so there's a, there's a lot of other rare species there. And uh, the timber rattlesnake, I mean, it, it's, it's limited in its range here. It's not spreading out across Vermont and terrorizing people. It's, sure. It kind of sticks to where its habitat is. Right. And um, it hasn't so far, knock on wood, caused any problems for people. I was just curious about this because the yeah. late St. Patrick wouldn't agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And we, we actually have one of our programs is, or one of the things we do for the public is if they have a rattlesnake that's anywhere where they want to be walking or they encounter one somehow, um, we free of service go and, and move it 
and move it to some, some other place away from humans. So There was a rattlesnake in Derby in 1959 or 60, mm -hmm. and it's a short story. So I actually want to, I'm going to interrupt you and say that we have a lot of great witnesses and not enough time for them. But and this I is a great story, though, know, but I, I won't we'll, go on. We'll have to hold on your story. I'm really sorry. I am, no, all right. I, I want to give everyone their fair chance. A lot of people have, have come to testify for the short amount of time we have. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, habitat, we all know what habitat is, right? Food, water, shelter. The important thing I want to emphasize is, is space as well. So if animals, you know, if we if we infringe on the habitat, if we want to put up, um, you know, solar panels or development or a mall or, or whatever, they can't squish into a smaller space. It just doesn't work that way. They need their space. They have their territories. They need their food. They need their place to, you know, to nest, to reproduce. Uh, and so whenever we do... Um, whenever we do remove habitat, it is removing part of that species population. There's really no way, no trick around that really. It is, it is what it is um, for the most part. I wanted to share the idea of niche, uh, another uh, concept in ecology, which is kind of like the role of a species uh, where it lives. And it is um, meant to explain what the species, it might be specialized in what it eats or what it does or how it interacts um, with its food resources, how it uh, exploits its food, food resources, uh, as well as what, how it uses the habitat. So all of those, all of those things can be considered the niche. And one of the sort of cardinal rules is that no two species can occupy the same niche. Uh, so it, what I'm trying to say with that is that, um, every species has its own unique way of contributing, and maybe this gets at your question, of contributing to the ecosystem that it's in that no other species duplicates. And so you lose that species and you lose the function that that species has in the ecosystem. And maybe that's okay, maybe, maybe nobody will notice, maybe other species won't be affected. Probably they're affected in some way that we don't even realize. But the point is, is how many of those can you lose before it's really a problem? Like how far do we let do we, do we go with that? Do we let that go before we start seeing more of a impact on the entire system? And we don't know the answer to that because you can't really know until it's gone, until it's too late. Uh, oh, these are just examples of one of the points I wanted to make is that a lot of uh, endangered and threatened species are specialists and that's why they're sort of rare because they need a particular kind of habitat. They're not generalists that, that can just live anywhere. So the bobcat, pretty generalist. They live in a lot of different kinds of habitats uh, across their range, deserts and swamps and obviously forests. Uh, Eastern meadowlarks are in the middle of there. They're tied to grasslands um, and it, particular grasslands with a particular kind of grass structure at that. They can't um, just move on to a different kind of habitat if they don't have grasslands to nest in. Uh, the left picture is a world, small world pagonia rediscovered after not having been seen in Vermont for over 100 years by our former botanist. And uh, that's an interesting species because it's a generalist, but it's extremely rare. Uh, and, and that's, I wouldn't call it generalist, but it's definitely not a specialist. It occurs in a variety of habitats that are pretty plentiful in the landscape. And it's probably due to over decades and decades, um, destruction of that habitat, as well as collectors who love orchids. And so orchids are sort of a sensitive species that tend to fall under those species needing extra, uh, extra protection uh, with uh, things like Location Confidential, one of the bills we, that we're talking about today. Okay, so how do we protect endangered and threatened species? Uh, like, like the way that biodiversity organized, is organized in terms of its various scales, I see our protections organized the same way, and I think that makes sense. You are all quite familiar with Vermont um, conservation design, I assume. Uh, Act 59 also uh, tackles conservation at the broad landscape scale. That encompasses, that brings with it natural communities for the most part. Uh, and that um, <clears throat> what we're focusing on today is that those that lower mm -hmm. level of the species level. Um, what species aren't captured by those efforts or what species need, may be captured spatially by those efforts but need extra attention for some reason or another because of the threats they face because habitat's not the threat they're facing, it's some other threat. Um, I wanted to make a point about um, 
needing robust populations. Our work is generally at the population level. We're, we're looking to conserve populations of species um, and, and we need them to be large enough. And ideally we need to have multiple populations if we wanna keep a species around. Um, you have all your eggs in one basket and uh, a disaster strikes and you've lost the species. So ideally um, we try to we try to conserve in such a way and manage in such a way that we're not leaving ourselves in, in that vulnerable or leaving the species in that vulnerable position. <clears throat> um, genetic diversity is important also. It makes the population more resilient, more able to adapt to changes. Um, if you have immigration and emigration between the different populations, you, have, you get a genetic missing, uh, mixing that makes the populations more resilient. So some, like I was saying, some of the species uh, fall through the cracks for one reason or another. Uh, the cobblestone tiger beetle is a really cool species, but it just, it lives on this cobblestone um, shores of fast moving water rivers. Uh, and it actually, it actually relies on flooding uh, to scour the rivers um, and, and keep creating that new cobblestone habitat that it needs. Uh, but if you have rivers that are flooding a lot uh, frequently or for long periods of time, that, that's actually a negative for the species. It harms the species. Uh, Ram said later, slipper is beautiful. Um, it's, it's very limited in its habitat uh, and um, it's rare, rare for a bunch of reasons, uh, but I'll, I'll skip through just to not take too much time here. <clears throat> so, how do, we, how do we protect these? Um, so Title 10, Chapter 123, Protection of Endangered Species, uh, it kind of lays out all the elements of our endangered and threatened species uh, protection in Vermont. It requires that the agency, uh, the Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources <laughs> maintains a list of threatened and endangered species. It requires uh, take a permit if you're going to take a permit, uh, take a species, meaning harming or killing, um, harassing uh, species. Uh, establish the non-game fund, which raises some money through uh, license plate and through tax donation uh, to help um, conserve species that are threatened and endangered. It established the Endangered Species Committee to advise the ANR secretary on all of these matters. And I'll get to that in a minute. And it also in 2016 established critical habitat where um, there, were, there was critical habitat established, the first three uh, were for three species. Um, uh, bats, a bat cave, a uh, spiny, spiny soft-shell turtle, uh, nesting beaches, and common tern uh, nesting islands. So just in case you're not familiar with the terms of endangered and threatened and the difference between them, uh, Essentially endangered is, is when the continued existence is in jeopardy for a species in the state. This is for state endangered. And then threatened is if the species is essentially uh, probably going to become endangered. It's sort of on the a verge of that. There's a lot of other species we watch, be, we, we keep an eye on and monitor aside from these two categories, which I'll talk about. This is the list of uh, species that are threatened or endangered in Vermont, not a list, a uh, summary of them. Uh, you can see about three quarters of them are plants. Oops, check self-served. And you can also see that a few of them are federally, federally listed as well. <clears throat> Critical habitat, I thought it'd be helpful to just remind everyone of um, the, what is critical habitat, the definition. It's, it's a specifically delineated location that has physical or bio, biological features that are identifiable, concentrated, decisive to the survival of the species, necessary for their conservation and recovery, and that may require some sort of special management considerations or protections, those things that our large landscape uh, efforts don't cover. So part of, part of the law is also uh, asked to set for Fish and Wildlife to uh, establish a plan for the management of non-game wildlife. And, uh, and this is sort of our guiding principles because we do have a non-game wildlife plan and we do all these things in the bullets you see 
in the wildlife diversity program. So this is sort of our directive uh, that we follow. Mm -hmm. The wildlife action plan is, uh, comes out every 10 years. You have a new one every 10 years. This is required by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And it, it incorporates all those different scales I've been talking to you about today. Uh, and it focuses on species of greatest conservation need. And there are several criteria that differ depending on what sort of species you're talking about to establish which species should be species of greatest conservation need. It's a mouthful. Uh, we, we call them SGCN for short, and nobody knows what we're talking about. Uh, but uh, they include our endangered and threatened species. Uh, but they also include a host of other species uh, for a lot of other reasons. Um, for example, uh, their sort of watch list, you know, we're, we're looking and we're seeing declining population trends or they're of regional concern. They might be okay here, but all around us, they're declining. There's a whole, there's a whole bunch of reasons that they may, uh, species may end up on a SGCN list. And the plan lays out, how are these species doing? What are the problems they're facing? What can we do about it? Um, it's, you didn't happen to bring it, John, did you? It's, it's massive. I'll bring it. <laughs> it's, it's about this thick <laughs> because it has accounts of all the species. Um, so it's, it's a big document, but there's a short version. Don't worry if you want to check it out online. Uh, and there's, there's almost, there's 970 something uh, species that are species of greatest conservation needs. So they're, they're species that everyone is keeping an eye on for one reason or another, or is concerned about. It could even be a lack of knowledge that makes it a, uh, <clears throat> an SGCN. It's just that we don't understand it well enough and we're concerned that we, that we need to, that we're missing something. Okay, so uh, I'll talk really quickly about the wildlife diversity program that I'm managing. Uh, again, we carry out those duties that I mentioned earlier. Um, those, those, um, uh, those, yeah, those duties that the law lays out through research and monitoring and conserving and protecting these species, and of course engaging the public. We do. I can't talk to you about all the research and monitoring we're doing today. I don't have the time. Um, I there. It's it's. It's amazing and almost overwhelming how much is getting done. But what I do want to say is that um, this is only because of, again, that team of partners that we work with across the state. Uh, we work with, I mean, there's people speaking here today who, uh, who we work with who are uh, carrying out programs that get the work done, and we're simply uh, assisting them in some way. So this is, I'm really talking about our program and what our program encompasses, but just understand that this is a huge group of people who are all coming together and, and, and carrying out their different roles and have their niches. Whole bunch of things we do to conserve and protect these species. Uh, this is just a, a quick list of some of the things we do. Guidance for homeowners is, is a big one for the bats. Um, Guiding foresters is also a big one for the bats, uh, but we work with all kinds of landowners for all kinds of reasons. Um, I'll talk about uh, regulation in a, in a bit. Uh, a lot of habitat protection and enhancement. On the bottom picture there, uh, the, that is spiny soft shell turtle nesting beach, and it has that, uh, that netting over it because if it wasn't there, it's placed there at strategic times. If it wasn't there, almost all the nests would be eaten by raccoons and other predators. So it's the way to keep the species going. Um, I am pretty sure they would be gone um, if we weren't doing that work. Uh, same with the common tern up top, Audubon, Vermont has been monitoring the tern for decades. Um, they nest on rock islands in Lake Champlain and uh, they require ongoing management in order for them to successfully uh, fledge nestlings each year. And in the middle, there is uh, Jessup's milk vetch, which is a federally endangered species as well as in Vermont. And um, we've actually been augmenting populations to make them more resilient because there's so few left. And, uh, and that actually worked out really well um, in the July floods because we, um, there was one or two populations that survived and the others did not. And, and so it's a good thing we had, um, we had more, than, more than one basket for the eggs, so to speak. And of course, outreach and education is a huge part of what we do constantly in everything we do, whether it's uh, engaging volunteers and having them help on the projects, 
working with our partners who engage volunteers. You'll probably hear about some of that today uh, and, uh, and putting out information, um, publications and social media, et cetera. One thing I do wanna make sure to touch on because it tends to get hidden uh, it's it's the, the it's hiding behind the curtain all the time, but it's incredibly important. Powerhouse uh, is uh, is our natural heritage database. This this database underpins all our work. It contains all the data that's been collected over the decades, and it's it's a deep dive in that it's not just oh we found this species in this one location. It has a lot of other information that surrounds it. For example, um, it, it's not just what's there and how many, <clears throat> how many populations are there, what's the condition of the population, uh, repeat visits to the same site, and, uh, and whether we think that this, these populations will <clears throat> persist, whether we think they're, they're not going to persist. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a data point, it's an assessment um, for each of those data points. So it's, uh, it's really different um, in that way from a lot of other data sets. It has a lot, a lot of information, a lot of context uh, that's helpful and hopefully will be helpful to future biologists. Uh, and it also, of course, guides um, our management decisions and conservation decisions. So, yeah. And that, that data are, those data are, um, are provided online available to the public. They're used by the regulatory community. So here we have in purple, um, natural community, a significant natural community, and then green are plants, uh, endangered plants, and red are endangered animals. You can go online and look this up. Um, and this is really useful for you know, consultants, developers, uh, conservation planners from the municipal to the state level. It's, it's used quite a bit. Um, and it's live updated every time we upload um, new data to it. So it's always uh, current, and that's really important um, for the users. There's another product called BioFinder, which hosts also the Vermont conservation design, <clears throat> as well as these data. Um, just be aware that these data aren't updated as often that platform. So a lot of people kind of use both. And the last thing I want to say about the natural heritage data is that it is um, standardized across all the states and actually all the provinces too, so that they can be served up with information at a regional and continental scale. So we can be looking at the larger patterns and how Vermont's, Vermont fits into them. This is done by NatureServe. It's called the NatureServe Network. All the states participate and contribute their data. Uh, and, uh, and nature serve is like the umbrella organization that hosts all those data and they're starting to pump out good, really great maps and doing some great modeling with that, that I think will be really useful to at least our regional conservation efforts. <clears throat> We're involved in regulatory review. Like I said, our, our data are used for regulatory review. Uh, but also we are um, engaged in under Act 250 Criterion 8 uh, to have no undue adverse effect on necessary wildlife habitat or any endangered species. And then Section 248 for, uh, for utilities um, and energy projects. So uh, the name of the game there is if there's potential impact to avoid, minimize, or mitigate that impact. Uh, and so we bring in our biologists of the relevant expertise, depending on what the potential impacts of any development project are. And we do hundreds of these every year. This is just a, uh, a list of necessary wildlife habitat types um, that I think have some overlap with endangered and threatened species. And we provide guidance on all of these as well to the communities that use it um, to explain what we how we define them, what sort of protocols to use to survey them, um, and what we're looking for when it comes to uh, avoidance and minimizing and mitigating their impacts. <coughs> okay, last but not least, uh, actually far from least, is the Endangered Species Committee. This, uh, along with our partners, this is um, one of the most important parts of the work we do is we get the benefit of input um, and expert insight into a lot of the, a lot of the work we do. Uh, the Endangered Species Committee uh, advises uh, 
and our secretary and the, the Fish and Wildlife Commissioner on uh, all kinds of things. I just have a short list here, but a lot of these pieces that uh, we're talking about today. And uh, they are made up of uh, three agency leadership, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Agriculture, and FPR, uh, Forest Parks Rec, and then also six appointees uh, from the public at large two engaged in agricultural or silvicultural activities and two knowledgeable in flora and two knowledgeable in fauna. A lot of times those uh, appointees are, um, are suggested by Fish and Wildlife and or the Endangered Species Committee itself. And usually, usually they're accepted and we usually have you know, good taste in who we select. <laughs> so Another sort of powerhouse that's behind the curtain a bit is um, what underlies the Endangered Species Committee. Those nine people aren't making all the decisions without a ton of input from scientific advisory groups. Um, there's a couple of people here who serve on those groups today you'll be hearing from. These are uh, essential to vetting the sorts of decisions that Fish and Wildlife is making and also to providing uh, recommendations, not only to the commissioner and to the secretary through the Endangered Species Committee. So they make their recommendations to the Endangered Species Committee. Endangered Species Committee then decides, votes on that and makes their recommendation. But, but they're really informed by these groups. And these groups uh, are chock full of some of the, a lot of the best experts in Vermont on, on their specific um, taxonomic group. So we have, we now have seven of them, we just added brighter bites and fungi. Uh, and there's experts on those taxonomic groups. And I don't know, it would be uh, horrible if they were all in the same room and all got COVID or something because nothing would happen with <laughs> endangered species uh, for, for a few weeks. Uh, it's, it's just, it's all the best uh, of the state. And we rely heavily um, on their input on all kinds of everything, almost everything having to do with endangered and threatened species. Very, very important part of our work, and um, I'm not sure what we'd do without them. We'd, we'd be making decisions without full information. So um, I can't stress that enough. Oops. Yeah. So uh, I, can, I can stop there. I was going to briefly mention what the listing and recovery process looks like. But um, if I want to check on time, yeah, that, that, that works. We do have a lot of folks in here. Yeah. I can um, prioritize uh, also people who are not regularly in the building. Representative Pat. Thanks. Uh, this came to mind from uh, my one experience dealing with a, a, an endangered species in the regulatory world. In, 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 um, in a land use regulatory proceedings or uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, energy related land use proceedings at the PUC, let's say, uh, if there is a, uh, a, an issue around uh, an endangered uh, species, um, who and, and, and there's an attempt uh, as part of the proposal, there's a, a proposal to, to how to mitigate mm -hmm. uh, that, who, who reviews that? In, 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 in that, how does that get reviewed to say whether that would work, that would be acceptable or not? Mm -hmm. Well, it's really, it's so that we have guidelines um, that, that suggest mitigation options, and those differ depending on what sorts of species or, or habitat is being impacted. Um, and it becomes a process of figuring out what makes sense. I mean, John, can, do you want to speak to... Well, it How it works on average, as you're alluding to, Roz, it, it depends on the circumstances and the species. So, if this, the this was a plant in my case, but it would. right, so it, it, likely there was a need for an incidental take permit to deal with the presence of the rare plant. Um, that would so that process would run parallel to the public utility commission process. So both would be dealing with the same issue simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But the issuance of the incidental take permit would be the, the main sort of force of law for the protection of the species and would lay out all of the terms and conditions for the protection and mitigation of impacts. And that, that permit would work its way through the Endangered Species Committee with input from the Species Advisory Group, in that case, the <clears throat> Species Advisory Group, 
that Dr. Langford referred to, and then ultimately up to the um, secretary of the agency for a final decision in the issuance of the Thank you. Sure. Madam Chair, I know you're pressed for time, so I, I yield to you in terms of how you'd like to approach receiving comments from the agency and the department on Bill H812. I'm happy to stick around for the duration and we can talk about it at the end. I don't want to shortchange the other distinguished guests that are here or and or I can offer a very brief Reader's Digest version of where we're at. With that. I think the brief Reader's Digest version would be great. We can get oriented and then we'll want to hear it again. So that'll help us um, in our learning curve. So here, here's where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, the agency and the department very much support the intent of uh, H8112 and would like to work with this committee to come up with language in a bill that um, would be realistic for us. The language in 812 right now is problematic from a number of angles, most of them related to capacity challenges. As one example, the designation of critical habitat for every listed species is largely unworkable and in some instances unnecessary. So um, that would be something to talk about. The frequency of updating the list would, would be another thing. On the other hand, there's things that you have in 812 that are agreeable and um, I have a suggestion that you could pull some of that out incorporate it into um, Bill H588, which deals with confidentiality for the protection of species locations, and move that forward now. And then um, step back for the bigger picture, because we all want to, we really want to work with this committee and other partners to take a, a new look, fresh look at the endangered species law and see what sort of changes can be made to improve our ability uh, reasonably to, um, to do better protections for these vulnerable species. I worry about trying to, um, with limited time now in the session, and this is a very complicated and important topic, try and pull something together in short order, rather than let's, let's take a, a couple of pieces of learning and fruit from what you have, put them in the other bill, move that forward, and then work over the course of this next year with you and partners to come up with uh, a bill that we can all get behind. Great, thank you. And thank you so much, um, Rosa and Fru, for that orientation to the department's work. Really helpful, great background. Thank you both. I just quickly say that was really That was very impressive. Thank you. The work, the work is great, but the presentation was great too. The work is really <laughs> All right, Jim Andrews. <clears throat> so, um, free to interview. Free to come around to the head of the table. Okay. Yes, yes. Technology. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Jim and I know each other from way back. He's a friend and a neighbor in Salisbury, just south of where I live. <laughs> good to see you here. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So I'm one of those partners that, that John and Roz has mentioned. I've been working with these guys for years uh, in their current position and then before they were in these positions. I've been working with Fish and Wildlife and working with their predecessors. My background really... I think probably Amy invited me because I chair a group. Uh, I don't chair, excuse me. I coordinate a group called the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas. Can you just, for the record? Yep. Say, oh, who am I? Name? Yes. <laughs> My name is Jim Andrews, <laughs> and I'm from Salisbury, Vermont. And I coordinate a group called the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas. I gather uh, information on the distribution, uh, conservation, natural history of all of the reptiles and amphibians in Vermont from around the state. Uh, I do that by working with Fish and Wildlife, but also working with um, VNRC, working with Bonnyvale Environmental Conservation Commission, and a lot of citizen science. So I try to get people to report what they run into in their yard, under the wood pile, et cetera, so we can 
we can get an idea of what we have. Now, the, the reason that that organization came about is that I chair one of the groups that Roz was referring to, the Reptile and Amphibian Scientific Advisory Group to the Endangered Species Committee. And I've, I've chaired that committee now for about 30 years. It's, it's been a while. And um, we very quickly realized that we needed more information on the distribution and abundance of the reptiles and amphibians in Vermont. And so we started gathering information and this reptile and amphibian atlas that I coordinate is a spinoff from the reptile and amphibian scientific advisory group that I decided would become kind of my life's work and have worked on this for years. As part of that, I've also uh, I've done research out of Middlebury College as a research scholar, and I, I've taught uh, at UVM. I'm no longer associated with either of those. I'm not giving them my research dollars. My research dollars are coming directly to me, um, which makes that a little bit easier. My The way I approach these bills is, is not really providing any background. These guys have provided all some great background, but just to look specifically at the bill and specific lines. And uh, I can do that with just one bill or I can go through all four of them. However, you can decide as we go along, depending on how much time I'm taking. Yeah, let's, um, if you can keep it specific to each yep. topic and synced, we, I mean, I don't know how much time you need to do them all, but definitely start with A12 and then okay. other thoughts would be. And then I'll let you judge. Okay, so H12. In the beginning, it's, it makes a statement about require the Secretary of ANR to revise the state list of TNA species every three years. Personally, I don't, I don't think this is necessary. I think we have a system that already works better than that. I think we have a system through the endangered, uh, the reptile and amphibian, through, this, through the scientific advisor groups. Most of these groups meet twice a year, if not more, and they are always reviewing the status of their taxonomic group. So it's ongoing. Um, there's a lot of communication that's involved between those meetings. Right now, for instance, uh, we've prepared a couple documents in my group uh, to look at the status of Eastern Ribbon Snake and whether or not we ought to recommend that one for listing. Uh, probably we won't. We've reviewed that one before. If we decide a species really should be listed, needs more protection, then we do the paperwork on that and we take it to the Endangered Species Committee, uh, which meets two or three times a year. They usually can turn that around in one meeting. So we take that information up, present them with the information. It's reviewed before we get there. If they agree, yeah, this really ought to be uh, proposed for listing. Then they turn that around in that meeting and then that recommendation goes to the secretary, but it's just a recommendation. We don't tell the secretary what to do, but we make these recommendations. And I would say the Endangered Species Committee, um, Committee is very receptive to what these scientific advisory groups bring forward. By the way, the scientific advisory groups are almost entirely volunteer. So this is a huge group of volunteers out there. 80, maybe I'm just coming up with a rough idea, um, that uh, represents the most knowledgeable group of experts on each of these taxonomic groups that is regularly going through the species uh, and trying to figure out, okay, this one needs more protection, this one we, meet, we need more data on, uh, et cetera, goes to the ESC. ESC, in my experience, very supportive of what the scientific advisory groups bring forward. And they turn that around, like I said, usually in one meeting, that would then go to the secretary of the ANR, and then the secretary then starts the process, the public and legal process, the hearings that need to take place, the paperwork that needs to take place, the legal work that needs to take place, uh, and then the once and interacting with Fish and Wildlife. I mean, it will go to her, and then she'll say, "Okay, you guys, what do you think of it?" Her staff. Um, so that'll go back and forth. That piece of the project takes a little bit longer. In some cases, that piece of the project takes a couple of years to get through all the hearings and to get through LCAR. We know, we know LCAR. 
Well, we know Elkar. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, good, good, good. yeah. Okay. It has to go through. And so that last step takes a little while. But the point I'm trying to make is that there is continual review of these species and whether or not they should be listed. So this 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 first piece here, H112, require the secretary of the ANR to revise the state list of TNE species every three years. Really, that's an ongoing process now that I think takes place more often than that. It takes place in real time all the time. Now, whether or not, I mean, there is a standing list and the standing list either gets added to or subtracted to, but that standing list, um, it's not like we would start over and want to review that thing every three years. That would be a huge job. And I will say that in, in my entire history of working with these people, although they can't say it, they don't have the personnel or staff to keep up with this without help. They can't do it. They, they um, I, the predecessor um, of, of Roz once told me, uh, being in this job is, is like trying to drink out of a fire hose. Um, there's just stuff coming at you all the time. You know, we know that feels too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what I'm saying is I think, I think we have a good system in place here and that requiring secretary to revise the list every three years would probably slow the job down and it doesn't seem to take into consideration the process that already exists. Um, further down, require the secretary to list critical habitat for each t &E species. Well, like Roz showed you, there's, there's roughly 53 animals and 163 plants that are listed. So over 200 species um, to list critical habitat for over 200 species would take an entire department, I think, rather than perhaps an entire new department to do that, to get all the information that you really need. We did start, as you know, listing critical habitat. And we were very, very cautious when we did that to pick species that really needed it, but pieces of habitat that were easy enough to protect without really uh, turning a landowner against it. We wouldn't just show up, let's say the entire population of some plant was on somebody's piece of property, some one person's piece of property and saying, hey, uh, this is now listed critical habitat and it's very limited what you can do with this piece of property. So we were very cautious in the approach in, in picking just these islands for the turns uh, a bat cave, a bat hibernacula, some beaches that were in part publicly owned already by the state uh, to protect nesting habit for the spiny soft shell species, spiny soft shell turtle. So I don't think that it would be realistic um, to list critical habitat for each TNE species. Would it help those species? Probably. But is it realistic to do that for all um, 200 and some odd species. Maybe if you picked habitat groups, grassland birds, something like that, pick a group and then work by group, a different habitat um, community types and work through it that way, or pick a couple species and move forward or pick public lands. What species do we have on public lands where we're not really uh, requiring uh, landowner permission. We required landowner permission on that critical habitat designation. Then they had to say up front, this was okay. Y you would not be able to do that if you tried to list critical habitat for all species. Is that a question or is it? Okay. So um, I don't think that's realistic. You could try to spread it out over time in some way or, or prioritize or group in some way, but uh, I don't think that's really doable. Um, prohibit the sale, offer for sale, transport, or import of, of TNE species within the state. 
I would have thought that that was already covered, but perhaps it isn't if it's in here. The, to prohibit the sale, offer for sale, transport or import of a threatened or endangered species. So you would need a permit for that. You just for the record speak. Uh, you sorry, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Catherine Guessing, and I'm general counsel for the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, you would need a permit for that simply because the definition of taking is so broad. Um, on the other hand, um, I do think it's useful to list those um, factors out explicitly um, because we are seeing more and more commercial collection of certain animals. And so there's no harm in putting that explicit language in the bill. So my statement here is, yeah, that makes sense. It sounds good. I have nothing against it. Um, it, it sounds kind of like an extension of the Lacey Act in terms of international, uh, not international, but across state boundary um, trade of those species. Great idea. Um, the bill would also allow the authorized taking of t &E species only to enhance the propagation or survival of a t &E species. When we get a permit request now that comes through Fish and Wildlife, comes through um, John, John Cart, um, the permit fella, brings it to the, the Endangered Species Committee, they have to check off one of the boxes as to what is the reason that they should be able to take an endangered species. And ordinarily, the box that is checked is economic hardship. And so that will be uh, somebody who wants to, to uh, build uh, a couple more dwellings on their property or um, uh, somebody who wants to, to uh, develop uh, further housing in the funeral home or in the old people's home or whatever. And so economic hardship is generally what they do there. Though I will say, and I'll just point this out as kind of an aside, uh, that one of the categories is to enhance the propagation of a threatened or endangered species. We do see that on occasion. <clears throat> And we did get one bill from U.S. Fish and Wildlife recently, one permit request from U.S. Fish and Wildlife that said that's what they were trying to do to enhance the propagation of an endangered species. And my response was, say what? This is for sea lamprey control. How are you calling this the enhancement of endangered species? And they check off that box and they say, well, because if we can control sea lamprey, there'll be less predation on sturgeon. And I said, well, oh, okay. That's true, but that's not your primary purpose for this permit request. And, and I would want to be clear that really I think what we're looking for is somebody to check off a box, which is their primary reason for asking for a permit. Um, but if you went down to only the propagation or survival of the T&E species, Really, the Endangered Species Committee would have very few permits to look at. And what I mean by that is, I mean, it sounds good ideally, but I really think you would piss off a lot of landowners in one fell swoop with that one. There would be lots of people who did not have the opportunity to talk with the Endangered Species Committee about what they would like to do on their land. Um, because I, I don't see how they could possibly say that they're trying to enhance an endangered species. So politically speaking, I, I would think that would be a real hard sell. You know, I would think if the development community hears about that or becomes aware of that, that you would stop yourself in your tracks with this bill. I, I don't see how you could get past that. That is the primary source, the primary category that shows up when permits come past us is economic hardship. Um, let's see. Okay. Require the secretary of a &R to adopt by rule practices that a person engaged in farming, forestry or silviculture practices may implement to avoid or minimize the taking 
of a threatened endangered species or that encourage critical habitat for TNE species. The department is really trying to do that all the time. It's trying to work with people out there, farmers, foresters, whatever, to figure out how they can best manage their land and still allow the endangered species to persist there. So the idea sounds very, very helpful, but once again, I think it's a huge job. And um, to do that for all 200 plus species is unrealistic. You, you, you could group species, you could look at grassland species, you could look at um, uh, vernal pool species, that kind of stuff, and come up with uh, best management practices, which I think is, is essentially what we're talking about here, BMPs, best management practices. Uh, but once again, I don't think they have the people to do that. And again, they can't say that, um, but I, 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 they would need additional people and additional funds to do that for all the threatened and endangered species to come up with best management practices and all those different habitat types. Um, I was going to talk about some of the background information, but Roz already covered it. Um, and, I, and I was glad she put up there, but I'll say it briefly once again, primary threats to all species, habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, habitat degradation. It's not the loss of an individual, it's the loss of the habitat or the degradation of the habitat. That is what we've got to, we got to get a handle on. So <clears throat> that was all I had to say on that bill. We're going to have to leave it there for now. Okay. Thank you. Are you going to invite me back sometime? <laughs> I'm back and just, you know, let you know that Zoom is also a very effective way knowing how far you have to drive to get here. I have comments on three more bills for you. It's great. And I guess we're happily overbooked sometimes. We're a little bit like an airline. We invite people to come in, and often not everyone shows up, but sometimes uh -huh. they all show up, and your seat's taken. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so with that little bit of philosophy, I'm actually going to invite um, Dr. Jason Hill up because he's from out of town in the Centers for Eco Studies, and others on the list are more regular in our building. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to be here. I appreciate it. Um, I will try to be succinct. And uh, my name is Dr. Jason Hill. Um, I joke that my father was Dr. Hill. Please just call me Dr. <laughs> um, Jason would be great. <laughs> but uh, I'm a quantitative ecologist with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, which is a nonprofit in White River Junction. I believe you heard from our Director of Conservation Science, Dr. Ryan Rebozo, recently. Um, and a quantitative ecologist, someone that uses mathematical models to describe natural processes, why populations go up and down and why they're not increasing, and what's limiting species from being recovered. So that's my area of mathematical expertise. Um, I'm also a proud member of the Vermont uh, Scientific Advisory Group for birds, the bird seg. And I'm a proud resident of Vermont of uh, White River Junction. Um, so in my past, I've worked with a number of state uh, and federal threatened and endangered species. I worked with uh, California sea otters out of college, which is a uh, uh, Federally threatened species, and I worked with red cockaded woodpeckers, which is a federally endangered species. And then for a year, I worked with Hawaiian honey creepers, which are mostly federally endangered and some uh, threatened. I have an unfortunate distinction of being one of the few people you'll ever meet that has eyewitnessed, watched a species go extinct. 20 years ago, I was part of a small group of people who was asked to go into the jungles of Maui. On the north side was an endemic species of bird that only occurs on the north side of Maui called the Pauli. That species had been rapidly declining when they sent us in in 2002. There were only three known individuals left. We spent a year trying to capture, at the direction of Fish and Wildlife Service, trying to capture those three remaining individuals and bring them into a captive breeding program, and we failed. Uh, we saw the three remaining birds uh, multiple times from this distance, just couldn't get them into our net and then into the helicopter and out. And I think I was the last person to see a female boli in the wild from just this distance without a net, unfortunately. But um, 
I know what it feels like to watch a species go extinct and to carry that feeling of being responsible for failure and how that affects all of Hawaiian, uh, all of Hawaii and uh, from everyone. I, I feel that as a personal and professional failure, um, even though I did everything I could and dedicated a year of my life to that effort. Um, I now conduct research with grassland birds and montane bird species. So those are species that have bleak future projection outlooks. So I work up, up in the mountains, I work in the spruce fir zone, and those are species like bicknell thrush and yellow-bellied flycatchers and black pole warblers, our crossbills and grosbeaks. Research and mathematical modeling by people like myself suggests that by the end of the century, none of those species will exist in Vermont. All of those species will exist only in Canada and to the north. We are expected to lose all those species and half of our spruce fir forest over the next 200 years due to the upslope movement of maple and beech forest communities. Um, I also did my PhD work with grassland birds and four of the birds I, I still do research with, four of those species are on Vermont's t and &E list. Um, Hensel sparrows, grasshopper sparrows, eastern meadowlarks, and upland sandpipers. So um, I, I should say, you know, I just point out maybe it's obvious, but Species don't go extinct anymore because of asteroids. Yes, geologically, time speaking, they do. Species go extinct or become extirpated, lost from a local area because of complacency, because of slow, steady decline, not because of some catastrophic event and you go out one day and they're all gone. It's from watching and accepting that decline and not intervening and creating action management at a point where there's still enough of left to them to change that directory around. So extinction happens and extirpation happens through complacency. Um, I, I, I personally, referencing the pool, Uli, I would say that I know that I can do better, um, that I can come up with better research questions, develop better mathematical models. And I think everybody, including uh, legislators, state agencies, and researchers can do more to protect and preserve our uh, Vermont's future flora and fauna for future generations. Regarding uh, House Bill 812, um, I echo Jim's concern about state capacity and also point out that, again that members like me who are essentially volunteers for the state on the scientific advisory groups, we do a lot of that lifting for those species assessments and for the state wildlife action plans that occur every 10 years. I'm a volunteer. I mean, I already work 80, well, how many ever hours of work a week I work with my two kids and, and I do this to help out on the side, but I'm a volunteer. And I really struggle to think how we would, the SAGs would fulfill that obligation meaningfully. We, I'm <clears throat> sure we could do a shoddy job, but I worry we've not been able to do an adequate job on a three-year idea. I would humbly suggest that a 10-year time frame could be more appropriate because it coincides with the requirements to complete the state wildlife action plans that allow Vermont to gain access to federal monies. So <clears throat> state wildlife action plans that happen every 10 years, much of that assessment would be duplicating the t &E species updating list. So those efforts could be combined. It would be administratively and personally less taxing on the volunteers and agency biologists. Instead of having to duplicate those efforts, it could coincide. So 2025 is the next state wildlife action plan, and we're already working on that right now. So yes, reduce the, the human administrative cost. I also think critical habitat is definitely an underutilized tool and desperately needed for some species. Other species, we don't know where that habitat should be or what are the limiting factors for those species. We don't have enough basic data. But with critical habit, critical habitat designation, and threatened endangered species management in general comes the need for greater transparency, not only to serve the needs of the public, but also to allow outside experts like myself um, to help inform the process, to make that process more likely to succeed and to make that process and the outcomes become more scientifically defensible. So transparency is key in allowing and welcoming the public's input and outside experts like myself who are effectively volunteers. I have a lot of examples that I could point to that very specific, maybe two in the weeds, um, about how management may occur and sometimes it's not directly in the best interest, in my opinion, of our t &E species. And probably the easiest and most concise thing I can think to point to is what is happening with grasshopper sparrows at Franklin County Airport. 
This is the most single important parcel of property in the state that houses maybe 40% of our state's entire grasshopper sparrow population at this single airport. And um, what, grasshopper sparrows are a state threatened species. It's possible they may be upgraded to endangered in the next, next assessment. But last spring, uh, VTRANS without a permit began bulldozing and paving over that grassland habitat to widen their air, airfield runways into that grasshopper sparrow habitat much to the shock and demise of everyone in the conservation community in Vermont, including me, who's spent 20 years researching grasshopper, or 15 years researching grasshopper sparrows. Um, so uh, VTRANS was subsequently given a permit for their retroaction, retroactive actions of destroying permanently that habitat, paving it under. Um, that caused a lot of backlash and mistrust between researchers like myself and the state uh, there was a lot written about it and published about it online. Um, we're still dealing with that lack of trust and, and the fallout from that. Um, you know, to me, at the, you know, to me that the lack of action and that that process was allowed to happen says a lot to me as a researcher about where we collectively value T and E species compared to future economic growth and development. Um, I have a question. I was only, only going to ask. Did they know? It is the most famous spot for grassland birds in the entire state. And yes, the, yes, um, it is a destination for birders and biologists conduct surveys there annually. Um, no surprise. Yeah. Um, and I should say another half of the population, you know, maybe another 40% occurs at Camp Johnson, the National Guard training facility. So two, two parcels of property maybe harbor 80% or more of the state's population for one threatened species. Representative, that has a question? Yes, Thank you. Uh, you sound like you're very expertise in this field. And I want to ask you something about the cormorant population in the state. Uh, there's quite an overabundance of cormorants. Mm. Uh, how, how would, what, what's your take on possibly eliminating some of the population because they're destroying property, they're, they're killing all the fish, they're destroying goose and duck eggs. What's your answer to the cormorant population? I've seen that out west for endangered salmon runs, this is a big issue of controlling cormorant populations that are feeding on salmon as they come through fish ladders where they're easy targets. The cormorants hang out on the dams. The management actions they've attempted to do in, Willamette, uh, in parts of Washington have unfortunately backfired where it's concentrated the cormorants, encouraged them to move upwards, uh, further up the river. I, I don't know that there's an easy solution there, but I, I am definitely not an expert on cormorants and controlling, but recognize that cormorants do play, do exert predation pressure on shorebird nesting and uh, in turns. Is that something not. that would be in your vision, uh, your field of vision down the road, if something was to happen where eradication might yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know, but there may already be some eradication for cormorants as they come to turn colonies. I'm not sure. Um, but that would be a tool for me as a mathematical person. I would want to crunch the numbers. How many cormorants would you need to control? And is that physically possible to, sure. to, to move the needle? Sure. Or is it just spinning your wheels and looking like you're doing something? Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer. That's fine. I, I appreciate your... Response. At some point when it works for you, we can talk about our cormorant program. Great. Thanks. I'd like to hear about it. Thank you. So just to quickly, <laughs> lastly, I'd like to say, um, so definitely transparency to allow outside experts to help drive and inform the process through free advice, uh, but also enforcement and adherence to existing rules and regulations is an obvious first step. But additional economic tools could be useful for the state for t &E species management as well. For example, I know right now, that uh, this is a real life example, but if a solar development firm was developing a field that had breeding grasshopper sparrows in it, they would have to pay mitigation for taking away that breeding habitat and covering it in solar fields. But that money is not required to be spent on the management and conservation of the state's dwindling and remaining grasshopper sparrows. That money would be, could be spent on other species of grassland birds, which is an odd, odd situation for me. Um, I think my personal opinion would be if money, if 
an individual species is, is uh, inflicted harm by development, that those monies recovered from that should go towards the management of remaining species, especially grasshopper sparrows. We have a few dozen individuals left in the state. Um, uh, Mitigation happens through the PUC process. Is that, is that correct, Andrew? I don't know. I'm asking the question. Um, Maybe someone else in the room knows. Yeah. Actually, it happens through Act 250 and through the public utility process. Both. The dollars for habitat lost for threatened endangered species. It's, it's, it's happened. One is it's with um, what Mr. Hill is referring to the solar project in, in Danville, where there was uh, potentially a grasshopper sparrow involved in the habitat that was going to be developed for solar energy. Um, I don't know that that's entirely settled, but in any event, we hadn't, when we came up, we had the, um, the mitigation fee approach for dealing with the loss of grass and habitat, largely due to the proliferation of solar energy development. Keep in mind, prior to, to the department working with partners on developing that approach, there were no protections for the loss of grass and bird nesting habitat to development in Vermont. It was only through the vision of the department working with partners to come up with that process because we saw the growing threats to that habitat and those species that we came up with this process. But it's it's not as straightforward as dealing with some other types of habitat and how you deal with the ongoing loss of the habitat, because you're dealing with most instances of agricultural activities, there's the need for active management. Say nothing of the capacity challenge and that part. So finally we're not dealing with um, listed threatened and endangered species. Most of the areas that were subjected to growth of solar energy were supporting bottlenecks and vesper sparrows and other species that are not listed. We're concerned about them and that's why we decided to protect their habitat. Um, and we're open to ideas for how to do this differently. At that time, however, the, the most straightforward approach was to come up with avoid and minimize first and foremost, we don't want them developing there for the where the birds are nesting in the first place. Um, but when you get to the point where you, you're willing to allow the project and there's still unavoidable impacts, we came up with this process where the developer would pay a fee to the bottling project and those funds would then be used to enhance grassland habitat in the state of Vermont to benefit the grass and birds. But one possible I propose would be an economic uh, or financial tool to potentially facilitate direct management of the species being inflicted harm upon by development would be mitigation banks. Conservation banks are successfully used in lots of other states. You may have heard of them for wetlands where they're very popular, wetland development banks. That's where a development happens that removes uh, a threatened endangered species or destroys their habitat. That money can be set aside into that financial instrument and then doled out at a future time when appropriate when there's an opportunity to directly inform conservation or management actions for that species. When you're talking about a species that's critically, when there's as few as upland sandpipers or grasshopper sparrows, there might not be an, an opportunity every year to actually spend money in, in a meaningful way to enhance that species. But three or four years down the road, a parcel property might become available. Those mitigation funds could be withdrawn from the bank and then used to purchase that property or pay for the management of that property in such a way that promotes that species. So a mitigation bank would be something that is successfully used in other ecosystems in other states and would be a great, I think, economic tool um, at the disposal of uh, fish and wildlife and ANR. Um, that's all I have prepared. If, if there are times I'm most happy to answer questions or yeah, great. That's, that's great. I think we'll have some follow-up questions for you. Do members have questions right now? Senator Stevens. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I, I have your note, transparency is key, and yet I've also heard the statement that we don't want to put on maps exactly where these uh, right. really critical critters are. So how are you, how, where's that? That's a great question. Yeah, so I'm not advocating that individual locations be uh, exposed to the public. And what I'm advocating is for that people like me are helped and be involved in the creation of policies uh, that that protect and promote those species. Okay. Yeah. So I I would happily uh, I, I would happily uh, 
So my PhD work was on grasshopper and Hanslow sparrows, two listed species here. And all, on the statistical side, it was also in sampling design um, and th theoretical sa uh, statistical analysis of populations. I'm like, I'm a terrific knowledgeable person of both the species and the mathematics to help design appropriate survey protocols to put in place for those species. And I would happily do so. So, so to clarify, in terms of being brought into the policy, you mean like our state team to be able to reach out and ask you for additional volunteer time? <laughs> yes, that would probably happen through the SAG, but there are a number of other people who are knowledgeable with those species on the SAG already. Yeah. And we are eager to do that. Does that need legislation? I think it probably means policy shift in, in philosophy and a value of how people like me are seen and in just cultural norms, perhaps, in our relations. Probably not legislation. Thanks for coming in and um, for your testimony. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Want to just add something on that, Jim? Well, just specifically to that question. For the record, say again who you are. Oh, Jim Andrews. Um, specifically to that question, uh, absolutely, I think there's a need to keep specific locations for some of these species out of the public eye. And, and that's particularly for collectibles. Um, I went online to prepare for this and uh, an adult wood turtle right now, uh, I could sell for 800 bucks. And if I went out there, I could probably get five or six in a day. And if they're going for 800 bucks, um, and those people who would collect and then sell those turtles are also knowledgeable about that particular group. And so it's really best to keep these private specific locations for the collectible species. And that's not all species, but to keep that from going public. Spotted turtle, it, there's a lot of turtles in here. I mean, spotted turtle and wood turtle. Um, and which also speaks to the level, one of these bills is increasing penalties. I mean, if if, if I can make $5,000 in a day, a penalty of $1,000, in a one in 20 chance that I might get caught, it's not much of a deterrent. Well, with that, we'll go with to Alan Strong, who's joining us via Zoom. Welcome. Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Ken. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much for the invitation to uh, come and talk about. Uh, Bill H-12, my name is Alan Strong. Uh, I am the current chair of the Endangered Species Committee. I also serve as the co-chair of the, or vice chair, I guess, of the Scientific Advisory Group for Birds. And um, I think I've been on the Endangered Species Committee maybe for six or seven years. I've been the chair for about three years now. So thanks. And uh, yeah, I appreciate your invitation to comment I think, you know, I would start out by saying, um, you know, to some extent, um, mirroring what John Austin and Dr. Renfrew said is that I, I'm just really excited that this committee is looking at ways to strengthen protection for Vermont's threatened and endangered species. Um, and I think there's just a lot of opportunities here to um, to think about ways that, um, you know, however I can help, but ways to think that we can strengthen the protection for these species. And I, I probably what I'll do here is just run through some of the sections of the bill and give you some comments that I have. And then, you know, if there's a few minutes for questions, I'm happy to take those as well. Um, so, you know, section three, Jim Andrews mentioned this already um, with respect to limiting the transport, um, import, export of threatened and endangered species um, within the state. You know, I, I think there's, it would be great to strengthen this. I think that's a really, um, you know, a really nice part of this uh, proposed legislation. Um, and I think as, you know, as Jim mentioned, with some of the endangered turtle species, which would be the ones who would probably be most vulnerable um, for the pet trade, I think this would be really great in terms of being able to, to strengthen their protection. Um, I was going to comment a little bit on, uh, on section 4A, um, which um, Jim mentioned 
um, about authorized takings and authorized takings only being allowed for the enhancing or, or propagate, propagation of survival of threatened and endangered species. Um, you know, one of the things that um, often happens, um, you know, Jason Hill, who you just heard from, is doing some research on eastern meadowlarks, which is a threatened species in the state. And one of the things he's been doing is putting transmitters on these birds to better understand their movements, um, where they're overwintering, and, you know, what are some ways that we might be able to um, improve habitat quality for these species and understand a little bit more about their life history. Um, it doesn't necessarily um, fall under enhancing propagation or survival. I think it is something that um, definitely is important with respect to helping us to better understand their natural history so we can protect them. Um, but it really does um, fall under that category of, um, of scientific research. And so just maybe thinking about some of the nuances that might come up in terms of what we would allow for an authorized take um, since uh, this um, proposed legislation, I think, um, eliminates the, the research component. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about um, a couple sections that I think may be challenging. Um, and you've, um, you know, I think you've heard from, uh, from John Austin and Jim Andrews a little bit about the designation of critical habitat for every species. And I did, I think I did pass along um, the form that the Endangered Species Committee uses to designate critical habitat. Um, and the way that form was developed was actually to take into all the components that are needed um, to satisfy the current, um, the current legislation. So we wanna check all those boxes to make sure that this critical habitat does in fact um, live up to the billing, that it is really something that's necessary and decisive for the survival of the species. And I think there, you know, there really could be some challenges um, in terms of uh, listing or designating a lot of critical habitat on private land. And so, you know, sort of thinking about being careful of that, if there are um, issues with potentially um, landowners thinking their property is, is, uh, is being taken or the loss of development rights, um, there could be some challenges there. Um, you know, one of the things that I was, I was kind of thinking about, and, you know, Dr. Renfrew mentioned the wildlife action plan. There's a, there's a section in the wildlife action plan, which is called habitat and community conservation summaries. And in that section of the wildlife action plan, it actually lists all the species of, greatest conservation need as well as threatened and endangered species that are found in a particular natural community. And, you know, this might actually be a way to think about sort of a different scale at which we could protect habitat for endangered and threatened species in the state. And so um, if you have a chance um, to look at that, and, uh, you know, I'd be happy to send the, the link along, um, that might be a way to think maybe a broader scale where we don't have to go through species by species by species, to list critical habitat, but we could take those natural communities that actually support lots of endangered and threatened species and think about ways that we could protect those habitats. And it might be a more efficient way than just um, looking at critical habitat in and of itself. Um, I, I won't say too much about the, um, the proposal to list the um, to assess, reassess the listing of threatened and endangered species every three years. I think, um, you know, Jason and Jim have spoken to this. Um, but one of the things I, I will say is that um, a thing that we're missing with listing of species is recovery plans. And I think there's a lot of opportunities there to create recovery plans that go along with the listing of species. Um, and you know, one of the things I think has sort of slowed the process down is that we are we tend to be writing like 40, 50 page recovery plans for every single species. And I think if we really looked at um, the recovery goals, what we need to you know delist or downlist the species, um, you know, kind of the resources or funding that's available, and then also a timeline for um, for recovery, a, you know, an estimated timeline. 
I think we could really um, condense those plans and make them something that we could um, that we could actually put forward on a much more timely basis. And then, you know, obviously the idea is to get species off the list. We don't want species just hanging around on the endangered species list forever. We want to recover them. So getting those recovery plans out, I think, could be really helpful. Um, let's see. The last, I, I guess, the um, the last thing I'll mention um, had to do with uh, Section 4E, which was the secretary, after consultation with Secretary of Ag, Food, and Markets, shall develop by rule practices for a person engaged in farming, forestry operations, or accepted silvicultural practices that may implement to avoid, minimize the taking of endangered or threatened species that in, and encourage critical habitat. Um, you, you've got the language in front of you. I didn't need to read that all. Um, I think there's some possibilities here. I mean, I think that um, as written, if you really wanted to um, get into essentially best practices um, for avoiding or minimizing takes, that could take a long time. But there's some there's some really good information out there right now. And for grassland birds in particular, rather than um, create a recovery plan for all the listed grassland species, there's something called the, the Vermont Grassland Bird Management and Recovery Plan. And so a lot of that information is out there in terms of best management practices for agricultural habitats that um, would help uh, conserve these species and, um, and help create better habitat. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's, there's definitely some potentially unintended consequences. You know, for example, um, a, a farmer who has eastern meadowlarks on their field and would like to avoid um, a taking could potentially convert that grassland to corn, which would basically, you know, avoid a taking, but would actually destroy habitat. So I think there could be some uh, some challenges there, but I, but, I, but I like this idea and I think there's some, some opportunities there. Um, Last thing, last thing I'll say is, you know, a piece that perhaps is maybe missing in terms of this overall bill is something that sort of vexes the Endangered Species Committee. And that is the fact that we end up, um, you know, kind of having to have a say on a takings permit at the, at the last minute. And a lot of this is because I think developers don't, um, don't, sort of jump into consultation with Vermont Fish and Wildlife early enough in the process. So the fish and wildlife, fish and wildlife are kind of left with a plan that's just like, um, you know, sort of iffy in terms of, um, you know, being able to provide advice from the beginning. And then the Endangered Species Committee and the scientific advisory groups are left with, um, you know, something that, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, if this is the best we can do, it's the best we can do, you know, with with endangered and threatened plants. Um, so many of these are transplanting them. So the, the development is going to go in and we're just going to take the plants that would have been destroyed and move them somewhere else. And, you know, I know there are better ways to do business. So I think, um, you know, something in here that um, talks about earlier consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service when there's a potential taking could be really helpful in terms of um, avoiding and minimizing takes of endangered and threatened species. So that was that was all I had to say, and um, I appreciate your time. And if you've got a minute for questions, I'd be I'd be happy to address any of them. Great, thank you for your testimony. Do members have any questions? Not seeing any. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for your work. Oh yeah, uh, I'll mention real really quick. Um, I did put a comment in the chat that um, one somebody on the committee wanted me to read. The um, New York Department of Environmental Conservation does oil eggs of cormorants on the Four Brothers Islands, which is the largest um, cormorant colony on Lake Champlain. So the oiling actually um, suffocates the embryo, and so they have very low nest success there. But um, you know, populations seem to be stabilizing or slightly decreasing on the Four Brothers Islands, but, um, you know, it also potentially leads, I think, as Jason alluded to, um, to colonies breaking up and them using other places, especially on private land. So it's an ongoing issue that, um, 
New York and Vermont are working together on. Thanks for that. Um, with that, we'll welcome Bob Galvin up. Hello, Chair Sheldon and esteemed members of the committee. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Bob Galvin. I am the Vermont State Director for the nonprofits Animal Wellness Action and the Center for Humane Economy. And I live in Richmond, Vermont. I have a master's degree in biology and several years conducting wildlife research, including stints conducting bird and bat mortality surveys on wind farms, assessing the effects of climate change and sea level rise on coastal communities, and relevant to this discussion, uh, researching two species that were listed on the Federal Endangered Species Act. So on behalf of AWA and CHE's members, I want to express my support for H812 and thank uh, Representative Sakowitz for introducing this bill and thank all of the members of this committee for co-sponsoring. So in the interest of time, I will just hit some of the key points about H12 and then I will move into some thoughts about H597. Uh, the first part of H812 of that I would like to mention um, is the requirement for the Secretary of Natural Resources to update the endangered spe or the uh, the list every three years. Uh, there currently is not a time frame that is um, statutorily required for these updates to happen. We heard from several members of uh, the groups testifying today that the process does work. I do want to um, kind of highlight written testimony that was submitted to this committee yesterday. Uh, the former botanist with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department stated, quote, in the past, some species have languished in a legal gray area after a positive recommendation by the Endangered Species Committee for listing or delisting, but lacking rulemaking by Fish and Wildlife Department, quote. So I'm not sure if there maybe are differences between uh, plants being listed and the uh, working groups associated with that and the reptile and amphibian groups, but did just want to mention uh, that there is some evidence that some of this uh, work is not going as fast as folks might like. Uh, next, I would like to talk a little bit about the critical habitat requirements of the bill. So um, I just want to give a little bit of background from a 2019 paper published in the journal Conservation Science and Practice titled Temporal Analysis of Threats Causing Species Endangerment in the United States. Uh, the authors underscore the connection between habitat loss and species being listed on the Endangered Species Act in this paper saying, quote, we found that habitat loss continues to be a top threat through time, causing species to require federal protection. An extensive body of research also found habitat loss or modification to be a leading threat causing species to require Endangered Species Act protection, and several analyses have documented extensive land cover conversions in the United States, as well as globally. It appears current federal and state regulations are not adequate enough to prevent habitat loss, which may result in species requirement requiring listing under the Endangered Species Act, end quote. So as mentioned by some of the previous speakers, there are very valid concerns regarding agency staff and resources that would accomplish the goal of designated critical habitat for every listed species. I would like to say that the scale of the current ecological crises that we are facing, be it climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, uh, makes it so should be considering this to a greater degree than we may otherwise have if the threats facing our wildlife and biodiversity were not so great. Um, I thought that the recommendation by Mr. Andrews to potentially have groupings of critical habitat, that, that seems like a way to not overburden some of these agencies who are doing good work and are already overburdened in many other ways, but still uh, 
highlighting and underscoring the importance of this critical habitat. Uh, moving on to the authorized taking of endangered species section on page six and seven, uh, I support narrowing the list of reasons that somebody can be authorized to take a threatened or endangered species. Um, there was some conversation about uh, economic hardship being a limiting factor or, and being a reason why this uh, schematic may not work. Uh, reading the incidental taking portion of the rules that follow the uh, authorized taking section, it seems to me like there may be some room there for folks experiencing economic hardship to have the, um, the burden not be put so directly on them. I'm not totally sure how to um, navigate that issue, and I don't want to discount folks experiencing economic hardship uh, to any degree whatsoever. Um, that is to say, I, I do think that this is a good idea to narrow the reasons that folks can uh, be authorized to take threatened or endangered species. The last piece of the bill as written that I would like to mention is the section on page eight on agricultural and civicultural practices. Um, I support the Secretary of a &R working with the Secretary of Ag to create some sort of rules or best practices that would guide um, loggers and, and landowners and silviculturists in knowing exactly when they are or are not negatively impacting endangered species. Um, so yeah, again, in the interest of time, I will skip ahead to H597. Uh, so I would like to uh, just bring this committee's attention back to testimony that was uh, heard within the last week from Representative Patrick Brennan on the topics of uh, reptiles, amphibians, and black bears in uh, Bill H-597. So as we heard last week, the sale of black bear gallbladders, bile, and paws are a topic of concern, not only for wildlife advocates, but for the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department as well. And they have supported language that would indeed prohibit the sale of black bear internal organs and paws from bears killed in the state. And so to give a little background uh, as to why this is an important issue, um, bear bile, according to a nonprofit called Animals Asia, is marketed as a cure for cancer, common cold, hangovers, and lots of other uh, ailments with little evidence that these treatments actually have any positive effects. In 2022, the Chinese Ministry of Health announced that bear bile was an acceptable palliative treatment for COVID-19. And so that announcement um, could have, have significant impacts on bears throughout the world, including in the United States. Uh, to that end, on July 29, 2021, in testimony submitted to the U.S. House Natural Resources Committee, a senior official from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service expressed for uh, support for legislation that would prohibit the interstate or foreign commerce in black bear gallbladders and bile, uh, noting, quote, black bear gallbladder trafficking is big business, end quote, and quote, the price for an illegal bear gallbladder can exceed $1,000 depending on the market. End quote. He added, quote, the bear species, the bear parts trade has caused rapid declines in Asian bear populations and other species such as the American bear, black bear, are now being targeted to fill that demand. End quote. It is worth noting that 34 other states from Alaska to Florida to Maine ban the trade in bear gallbladders. Only six states allow the uh, the sale of black bear gallbladders and other viscera from bears killed legally within the state. Uh, and Vermont is one of those six states. If we are interested in ensuring that black bears do not eventually become a threatened or endangered species in connection with uh, our conversations relating to 812, it is worthwhile to consider whether the black bear portion of uh, Representative Brennan's bill 
might be um, introduced or might be taken and put into another bill that um, that is being considered. Uh, there are also considerations to reptile and amphibian conservation in H597 that I think are valuable and I think we should be considering uh, again when contemplating how to make sure that species that are currently existing on the Vermont landscape do not go the way of threatened or endangered species and their populations don't, um, don't you know, plummet as a result of all of the uh, issues and threats facing our wildlife. Um, for example, prohibiting the take and collection of specified reptiles and amphibians, as mentioned in H597, would be uh, one of those good provisions that would meaningfully help to protect reptiles and amphibians in the state. Um, just, I also would like to second Dr. Strong's uh, emphasis on recovery plans. And I think that there um, may be room in this bill or in other endangered species con uh, conversations to really drill down on those recovery plans and how we can make sure that they are functioning as as we need them to, we heard uh, some evidence that some may be too long, that it may be a bit clunky of a process to timely act on when there is a, an urgent need to protect these species. So taking time to consider how we can figure out the best recovery plans seems very uh, valuable and germane to this committee's work. Um, I will stop there for now. Um, thank you very much for giving me the time to testify. Any questions? Thanks for your testimony. Sure. Members have questions? Thanks. Um, we have one last witness, Jamie, we probably have max 10 minutes. Do you, would you like to? Okay, great. Please join us. So good afternoon. I'm Jamie Fidel with Vermont Natural Resources Council, General Counsel and Forest and Wildlife Program Director. And appreciate the opportunity to be here today uh, to talk about, I'll talk primarily about uh, H8112, uh, uh, 812, and I know focused on some other bills. And uh, just want to start by saying that um, it's really great, I think, for the committee to be having a discussion on, on this law and the status of threatened and endangered species in Vermont. I appreciate Representative Sackwitz's interest in, in the issue. Um, when I went to Vermont Law School a couple of decades ago, I actually focused on biodiversity policy and the law around biodiversity conservation and wrote a white paper on how to strengthen Vermont's threatened and endangered species law. And so it's just it's personally refreshing to see this conversation happening, and there have been improvements to the law since I wrote that that paper. But I think it is it is a timely topic, um, and it was uh, you know one of the recommendations in that paper uh, was to allow for the designation of critical habitat, which subsequently happened when Commissioner Porter helped to move that through the legislature about I think maybe five years ago, which is something that VNRC supported. But building off that paper, I actually interned at VNRC. And one of the, the first things I did when I, I started working at VNRC was I, I came to the, to the state house and lobbied for about a doubling of the staff of the non-game and natural heritage program, which was the name of Roz's program subsequently. Um, and there was, there was some committee discussions about the fact that there were, there were resources that were needed in the program, that there was good work happening there, but we, we, we did not have adequate funding and resources for the recovery planning that was needed um, for, you know, species conservation efforts that, that certainly could benefit from some more resources. You know, sadly, I was, I, I was a bit naive thinking that that would magically happen because it didn't come to fruition, but I do want to say that I greatly respect the work that folks are doing in the department. Um, BNRC has worked closely with a number of the professionals uh, or with a lot of the professionals in the department, especially when it comes to species recovery, 
not only folks in the department, but these partners that are here today and others. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of really talented people putting a lot of effort into this. So with that as, as background, I, I, I do think that, so I am sympathetic to the idea of how do we accelerate you know, species recovery? And whether that's you know, looking at how do we accelerate the rate of uh, habitat, uh, a critical habitat you know, designation versus putting efforts into the recovery planning, it's, it's, it's all really important. And I really do like the idea that Mr. Austin presented of let's take a comprehensive look under the hood at the law, because I think that there's, there's actually a number of other provisions that would be really beneficial to examine at the state at the same time. And so I just want to quickly list some of those that we think could be helpful if there was going to be a sort of a comprehensive look at the law um, and the kinds of questions that would be helpful to, to, to examine. Um, and so, and I, I am sympathetic to sort of like how functionally would it work to just require automatic critical habitat designation for all species. I do think it's worth looking at how can we prioritize within that? Like has already been said, there's been some good ideas that have been uh, presented here. You know, can we focus with some assemblages, a species, suite of species, grassland habitat has been, been mentioned. Um, so we could, so I think by stepping back and kind of looking at where can we prioritize, there could be some good recommendations. Um, but I would also say that, um, as has been mentioned, examining the recovery process and how that relates to delisting species, examining really the resources that are needed, kind of going back to the original part of my work with VNRC is, is um, and if there's capacity in this building or through other funding mechanisms to look at ways to expand the staff, then we could look at ways to have <laughs> the work that's part of this bill. Um, and recovery planning and mitigation planning and other elements of species conservation. As I've already said, you know, understanding if there are certain species or suites of species that warrant accelerated attention for habitat designation, understanding if there are additional tools for habitat conservation. That was kind of what I was looking at in my papers. There's these, some models of incentive-based programs that have actually worked in other parts of the country. It would be worth looking at, can we grab other tools that we're missing right now? Are there additional tools that would help landowners um, and if they're incentive based, then then perhaps we get uh, we get some good benefits um, if we can look at structuring it the right way. I would say it's important to look at the role of the endangered species committee. I appreciated hearing Alan Strong's testimony. I think there's a lot of great work that that committee does in advising the secretary. It's an advisory role, and we have seen some examples where they provided input, and the, and the secretary has not agreed with the endangered species committee. And you know. How to rectify what the role is of the committee as stay strictly advisory. Um, I, I think we could look at, you know, it, it, how the agency responds to the, to the endangered species committee's input. If they do disagree with the committee, maybe building a stronger record of why so we can really understand, you know, why maybe the scientific input from the committee is not. And if the agency has its own expertise that they, they just simply disagree, then I think it could be helpful just to outline what that what that process looks like a little bit more. Um, and um, I would say that uh, the example of the Franklin County Airport has already been been brought up. I think that was that was an example where there were, were disappointments. I wouldn't say necessarily from what we saw as how the agency was trying to protect the habitat, but certainly disappointing that VTrans went ahead with that work without securing the necessary permit up front. And I would say that because of the, the, the funding pressures that went along with that project, that the permit was, was issued very expeditiously. And you know what we what we saw through that process was a couple of things that were concerning to us. Where, for example, the grassland restoration and management plan and the long term grassland habitat mitigation strategy were developed subsequently to the permit being issued. And so, um, you know, some of them happening many days after the permits issued. So for us, part of the complication, and if, if that happens, and I think that more an anomaly, I don't think that's the basic practice of how the permitting works. But if it does, it means the public, like a group like ours, doesn't get to comment on those mitigation plans. And it means the permit's been issued. And so if those plans aren't being executed you know, very well, then it has to become an enforcement issue. In our minds, there could be some work to improve the process that's outlined in the law itself to say the permit is approved when those, those plans are developed and, 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 and developed adequately to the satisfaction of the agency. And then the permit should be issued. I've been kind of doing it subsequently. And if there are issues with that, I would, you know, obviously want to know. 
Um, if there's more flexibility that's needed, I would want to know why, but I just think it's, it, that was a troubling sequence. And so I think if there's an opportunity to look under the hood at the law, those were actually some comments that we, we, we raised to the, to the department before this bill was introduced in the fall. And we had actually asked to have a productive kind of dialogue with the department to see if there are ways to actually improve the law. So I really do support efforts if there's a way to kind of sync some of those ideas with the broader ideas that are here with what other folks have put on the table today, that it really does make sense that this is a timely opportunity to look at what provisions in this bill are, uh, could move now, what are more appropriate to step back and look at more comprehensively to have maybe a set of comprehensive recommendations come back to the committee for future work next year um, and allow for some important discussions to happen about looking comprehensively at sort of the whole list of, of ideas that could be tackled through an update to the law. Um, and so with that, I know we're short on time and I could you know, follow up in writing with if you want to know which provisions we think, you know, support at the moment versus those that, you know, would benefit from a broader conversation, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. But um, I'll just, I'll, I guess I'll pause there. You know, short on time. Uh, we definitely welcome your and other folks here who've joined us in this conversation's written testimony and suggestions on the bills that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, I think we'll look for guidance from the department on pieces they think um, feeling comfortable moving, and then and then everyone everyone else's comments are very welcome. And then what might go into the further study category be really helpful. And although today was compressed, you know, if we're able to do something with this bill, we will have more time to hear from all of you again and others on this topic. Thank you all. It's clear that you're passionate and giving a lot to the state of Vermont. So thank you for your work in all of your different capacities on this topic and for joining us today. We're adjourned for the afternoon.